Welcome to my Cisco's Connecting Network video. This is the fourth video set for the CCNA material. In this video, we're doing Chapter 2 Review, Connecting to the WAN. Keeping in mind, Connecting Networks is the WAN that used to be uh, focusing just on WAN technology. So that's the point of this chapter. We are looking at things like different WAN technologies and how to select a WAN technology. We're going to be talking about and describing the purposes of WAN, its operations, its service areas, and we're going to be comparing both private and public WAN technologies. We're going to be ending with a how to select the appropriate technology. Alright, so first one, WAN technology overview. So our WAN is what sits between our edge, whether it be our campus edge, our enterprise edge, our edge of network, the internet, and our remote locations. Remote locations could be a remote branch, could be remote users, telecommuter, uh, telecommuters, all of that. The WAN is typically provided by a service provider. Our largest WAN is going to be an ISP, the internet. And we pay a fee to use that WAN. So why are WAN is necessary? Businesses require communication globally, uh, remote location, remote offices. Uh, we have to share information between our organization and other organizations. And we, we may have mobile workers. Home computers must, also, must be able to also send and receive data across you know, large distances. Uh, consumers purchasing online. Students having to do online research. Combination of both. Here we have the evolving network. Uh, companies expected their networks to perform optimally and are able to deliver an ever-increasing array of services. Created this thing called a span. Span engineering is uh, one of the big ones, and it's used in this throughout this entire curriculum. Span is just a fictitious company that we're using to show how the evolving network happens. So the environmental consulting firm, Span Engineering has 50 employees, a lot of CAD, and then they've been upgrading from a single LAN to multiple LANs. They've been increasing their uh, environment, their printers, their computers. Uh, they want to now implement VoIP. They want to implement uh, higher speed technologies for remote locations like DSL or broadband. And they want to offer some basic services like FTP because CAD is kind of large. And as they're sending and receiving information, from other users, they want a way to have other CAD users upload their drawings or other architects update their drawings. So they started looking at the campus network because over their five years, they've grown tremendously. So they've contracted to design and implement a full size waste conversion facility. I'm not sure why they're doing waste, but that's what they decided to do. And they want other projects in the neighborhood uh, municipals and other parts of the country. They hired more staff. They got larger. And so they went from a small network to a campus network. Small office, few employees, to a large office with several employees. Six years later, SPAN also increased. It's been increasing in its uh, capacity and its jobs. So now they're also looking at uh, data center space. So not only do they have a central office, they want branch offices, and they want a few of the regional offices. So Span Engineering has now grown, and they've been in business for 20 years, and they've got thousands of employees, several remote offices, and the cost of the network and its related services has started increasing in expense. Looking to provide the best network services at lower costs, they started looking at how to encourage telecommunication, virtual teaming, 
and other web-based applications to help increase productivity but also to re uh, reduce costs while keeping things securely. So they started looking at what's called a site-to-site -site VPN. Other network requirements are distributing employees uh, throughout the country. The, must, uh, the network must also be able to be uh, adaptable and grow based off the company's needs. So this is what they came up with. They wanted a centralized office that allowed tunnels to go through the internet instead of having a different technology connecting everyone. They want to use the public internet and create tunnels. That way all traffic is encrypted through the tunnels and you can have home users and telecommunicators and you can have remote and branch offices but still everything connects back to our main office. But how does it go through the internet? The internet has multiple WAN technologies and those WAN technologies happen at the layer 2, HDLC, PVP, Frame Relay, Ethernet, Ethernet WANs, MPLS, VSAT, Broadband. Those are different types of WAN technologies as they relate at the layer 2 of OSI. The nice thing is, these are all internet WAN services. So let's go and look at WAN, like the cable network. Here we could have a plain telephone system and we could have a WAN connection coming from the cable company. DSL versus broadband. They're going to connect probably to the same ISP, they're going to go through the same network, even though we don't see the ISP's network. We don't really care how the ISP communicates, we just want to be able to use the ISP to get through our devices. The two most common types of WAN are going to be uh, switch technology versus circuit switching. In a circuit switching, the um, types of circuit switching WAN technologies are public. All right, so sorry. We're going to talk about search, uh, circuit switching first, then we'll talk about packet switching. Circuit switching has two major types, public and integrated services. That public uh, is going to be more like a traditional phone line, and the integration one is going to be more like the ISDN. Again, circuit switching is going to be dedicated circuits through uh, their network, meaning you release a line all the way through, as opposed to packet switching. Packet switching, as it goes between A and B, it may take is broken down into individual packets and those packets may be sent to or sent through multiple devices or they may all flow through the same device. It just kind of depends how the network is operating at that time. So again, packet will split traffic data into packets that are routed over a shared network and it can go through pairs of nodes to communicate over the same channel or it can go through individual connections it just kind of depends. So how do we select our WAN? The common WANs are broken into two categories, private and public. Within the private, there are dedicated items and switched items. In the dedicated items, that's where your T1s, your T3s, but they are old and expensive. They still exist, but again, old. Trying to get a hold of my marker. Expensive and low bandwidth. Private switched, you can have circuit switch or packet switching. These are older and still slower. T1s are still faster than these guys, but they're expensive. Switched also has this packet switch technology. Metro Ethernet, Ethernet, MPLS, Frame Relay, ATM. These are better technologies for our WAN connection and are very common. On the public side, you have the internet. And the internet, for most people, are connected to either DSL or cable or wireless. The larger institutions are using these guys. Home 
is using DSL. Large businesses are using these guys. So let's look at some different types of WAN technologies. Here, DSL, here we're using coax, here is wireless, here is lease line, here is satellite. The ISPs don't really care. It will go in one way, out in another, it doesn't matter. How it gets from A to B through an ISP, we don't really concern ourselves with. So let's talk about some of these. Leased lines. Leased lines uh, have some advantages. They're simplistic, there's good quality, and they're available. But the issue with leased lines is they're expensive and they're limited. Because a leased line is not going to the internet. It's literally a point-to-point -point connection. Dial-up. Simplistic, available, low uh, costs, but they're slow. Very slow. Good for backups, backup or a failover connection, but that's about it. ISDN is very similar to a dial-up connection, but it uses several channels to make up faster speeds. ISDNs have a BRI and a PRI. And ISDNs typically have a combination of these channels, thus making their speed. We're not going to get that far into depth with ISDN. It's an older technology, so it's one that's not really heavily used anymore, so I'm not going to spend the time talking about it. Frame relay is one of those conceptual ones that you still see a lot. Uh, even though I don't see it in business as often, Conceptually, you have to understand how this one works. We will create what's called a DLCI, or a Data Link Connection Identifier, between two locations. And they will travel through an ISP, forming a point-to-point -point connection through an ISP. They also create what's called a Private Virtual Connection, a PVC. It will act like a point-to-point. -point. So like R1 to R2, it's going to act as if there's a dedicated point-to-point -point between those two. However, in reality, it's going through a ISP. The DLCIs will have a number associated with them because you're going to be pairing them with one another. ATMs is ba uh, based off of a cellular item where we may end up having multiple connections or multiple spaces. So for example, for every time one email packet gets sent out, maybe we want two VoIP packets. And so maybe for every one email, two VoIP packets and one web server. So you can separate these into certain cells. So basically, it's not going to be based off of a frame, it's going to be based off of a cell. And we're going to do smaller packet sizes within these cells. But that way you can control packet flow. It will always, for in this example, flow one email packet, two VoIP packets, one web server packet, two plus video packets. And it will keep following that pattern. Even though ATM is kind of old, I have not really seen them heavily used anymore. A few of them are still out there. Ethernet WAN is going to be the next major one. It's all the benefits of Ethernet, but on the WAN side. Reduces expense, it's easy to install, enhances business productivity. Because again, we're going to go to a ISP, and that ISP is going to give us an Ethernet handoff called Metro Ethernet, because we're going to be attached to a Metro Ethernet ring, or whatever topology, doesn't really matter through ISP, and we're going to be able to share between all locations as if they were just an extension of that LAN. Part of that Metro E is also called Ethernet over MPLS, or even a VLPS, VPLS, Virtual Private LAN Services, VPLS. Because again, how it's going through the ISPs, we don't really care about. That's the purpose of an ISP. 
So let's talk about MPLS for a little bit. MPLS is a multi-protocol label switching. It's a protocol that's high performance fan technology and it directs traffic from one router to the next based off of a short label rather than an IP. Here we have a customer's edge, a CE, and we have a provider's edge, a PE. Within the provider's network, it could be an MPLS cloud. So how our different customers connect to one another is not important. What is important is our customers can flow through that MPLS cloud to get to their customers or to any other device on the internet. Again, the different layer two technologies within the ISP, it doesn't matter. Another heavy one is VSAT, which is basically a very small aperture terminal. Basically, it's satellite. DSL is going to be using a twisted pair through phone. Cable will use a traditional coax cable. We also have different types of wireless, like uh, municipal Wi-Fi. That's going to be more like outdoor Wi-Fi. We have WiMAX. We have cellular data. We have satellite internet. Oh, jump the gun. Cellular data. LTE and 4G. And these are just, again, internet via your cellular phone. We have a few VPN type technologies. Uh, VPN could also be a VPLS, a tunnel through the internet, uh, through an ISP. We can also have just a standard VPN through the internet that's not VPLS, that the end user is set up not set up through the ISP. And that's uh, two major types are gonna be like a site-to-site -site VPN or a mobile slash remote access slash SSL VPN. The site-to-site, -site, you have to set up the addresses per site. So you have to have site A and site B, their addresses, their internal networks, and you have to give those details. With a remote slash SSL type VPN, you're gonna have a mobile user connect through the internet, so their address is gonna keep changing while the destination address is gonna stay at the same. So you can connect back to HQ, for example, as your mobile person using a remote or SSL type VPN. How do you do the how do you pick the best one? How do you know what WAN technology to go with? How do you know your ge uh, geographical scope and what are your requirements? Those questions are what you have to ask yourself to figure out what WAN technology is good for you. If it's geographical, if there's a time delay or a latency requirement, those are gonna be factors that you have to put into selecting your WAN link. Our WAN link, are we using private? Are we using public infrastructure? Are we doing dedicated or switched? Are we going to use the internet and then do VPNs? What connections are available in my organization, off my policies, also in my city, provided by ISPs? Also, what's the cost? Okay, that's always a fun one. I may want certain technology, like I really want Metro E, but Metro E in my area is super expensive. So I'm not even going to bother talking about Metro E as a business owner because I can't afford it. So I may have to go with a different technology, maybe the internet with a VPN. I have to be realistic in my costs. And that is this chapter in a nutshell. We talked about different types of WAN technologies, where the WAN technologies are located. We talked about the different types of wireless. We talked about point to point. We talked about VPNs. And that is the end of this material. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.